have fun with. That's the bottom line. So I think, you know, with this many people, and I must say this is the most comfortable venue I've ever delivered a lecture in. I'm sitting in my office chair and I've got a glass of wine here. And uh, um, so it's a pleasure to, to uh, speak with you all tonight. I'm looking forward to the questions as we progress. But uh, Joe wanted me to do a little bit of intro on, you know, with this many people, I think there's close to 70 signed up. I don't know if that's everybody on right now, but um, you're all at li different levels with your wine expertise. So I think the important thing, if you want to continue to get better at uh, learning more about wine and where the grapes come from and how wine is made and all of these things, um, reading is really the only way. I'm sure some of you uh, subscribe to the Wine Spectator or Decanter Magazine or the Wine Enthusiast or any of these publications, and there's many more. But um, I think the, the, there's no shortcut to um, getting better at learning probably geography. I think the starting point to understand the differences in wine has to do with the geography. You know, you can look at soil and climate and all of those things that are important too. But, you know, if we look at the world of wine, I think the starting point would be old world wines, which is anything on the continent that may have started in Roman times. Um, so that's of course, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, uh, any of the uh, countries on the continent. And then we have new world wines and that's any place that was either uh, explored and discovered or people were exiled to. So when we think about new world wines, I think the starting point, which most people have a pretty good foundation on would be California wines. And now the Pacific Northwest has jumped in with um, Oregon, great Pinots coming out of Oregon and Washington state, which is doing terrific things on the east side of the Cascade mountain range. So that would be um, California and all 50, and we have Chuck on board and I think Fran tonight and um, they're uh, up in the uh, Finger Lakes area of New York, another great area uh, in America for producing Riesling. I think Chuck does 10, I, I read your uh, uh, website and it's very good by the way, Chuck. I, I think you're making 10 Vitas Vinifera grape varieties and uh, I think you're drinking, was a Pinot Gris I saw earlier? I know you can't answer me, but um, I think that's what you- That was me. Uh, yeah, okay. But I'm yeah. cheating, because it's very good. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, okay, very good. All right, excellent. So Chuck, Chuck, what, Chuck's drinking Jeff's the best, Jeff's our best customer in Maryland. He's our only customer in Maryland. <laughs> okay. Good. Not true, not true. <laughs> um, so I think, and then the rest of the new world, of course, would be the Southern Hemisphere. When we look at um, South America, the big three are Argentina, Chile, probably the big two, but now Brazil is doing some nice things. Uh, the Antipodean Islands, New Zealand and Australia uh, have been making, you know, Australians have been making wine for 200 years, but they're kind of relatively new to America. Um, and then, of course, when you come across to um, South Africa, kind of an old world, new world combination after apartheid, they opened it up for people to uh, uh, start producing wine. So there's a lot of small family owned producers in, in South Africa. So one of the questions I got earlier, what's the difference between old world wines? I think they call it countries, but a broad brush, and we have to broad brush all of these statements because there's so many variables when you come to climate and climatic conditions and soil compositions and top, so top soil, what you know, compounds are in that. So there's, a, there's so many variables that allow the world to have so many different types of wine today. So um, I think to realize the difference between old world and new world is old world, again, broad brushed, but perhaps more rustic in style. Old world is earthier for the most part. You know, some of these farms have been farmed for 2000 years. Uh, the soil has been, um, you know, added back certain nutrients and so forth. But old world theoretically, and I, I'm classically trained, my passion has been Burgundy 
France, all of France, but Burgundy and then German wines are my other passion, which I think two of the most difficult areas in the world to fully comprehend. But um, I like old world style, but new world is what most people are drinking in America today because it's bright fruit, it's clean, it's um, very aromatically driven, uh, very balanced wine is a sunshine, um, in a lot of parts of the New World countries, which ripens the grape and therefore uh, ends up, you end up with a balanced wine with alcohols that match um, the flavor, flavor profile of the wine. So I think understanding old world versus new world uh, is probably the starting point. Now I see a lot of Italian wines on here and, and I see some new world things, uh, Bordeaux, I see Amador County, I see, uh, uh, Pinot Noir, which is terrific. I see Nyers, great friend of mine, Bruce Nyers. Um, Chimney Rock, A Lavage, I see. So you guys are all over the place, which is terrific. I love that. And I don't think you want to funnel yourself necessarily into, uh, I mean, if you find something you like, you obviously stay with it. But I think one fun part of the world of wine is to experiment a little bit. And I think when you would look at, once you have determined, do you like old world style or new world style, then what color do you like? Do you like white wines? Do you like red wines? Do you like pink wines? Do you like champagne or anything with bubbles in it? Do you like dessert wines with higher residual sugar? So there's many subdivisions beyond those areas of new world and old world. So I think you kind of, um, I would look at a palate progression at a, at a dinner perhaps would be to have uh, bubbles at the beginning, uh, maybe a white wine with the appetizer, again, broad brush. Uh, and most people just have one bottle, one glass, but, um, and then perhaps a red with the entree and then a dessert wine with, uh, if it's a poached pear or flan or chocolate, uh, flowerless tort, that's all up to you. But I think those are the categories. Uh, the whole thing, when you're starting to look at what wines you enjoy and do you like, what foods do you like to enjoy them with? Um, I think the key is keep the meal in balance. In other words, if you're drinking light and delicate wines, you probably want to have a light and delicate food items. So appetizers, fish, chicken, those things are usually lighter than the more powerful uh, beef, rack of lamb, beef wellington, whatever it is. Um, those are more conducive to the big, uh, more full flavored uh, red wines of, you know, Cabernets from Napa Valley or, um, you know, Bordeaux wines or Italians, great, you know, we have a saying, if it grows together, it goes together. So I saw there was a Brunello on here earlier, but anyone that enjoy, that's, that's from Toscana, but if you like Piemonte wines, uh, Barolo, Babresco, Nebbiolo, any of these wines work with those um, uh, red meats too. I mean, again, keeping the meal in balance. You don't want the wine to overpower the food and vice versa. So that's why I, I recommend keeping the meal in balance, if that makes sense to you. Um, so what was, the? I just want to see a couple of things here. Um, Bacchioli, some very nice things here. Um, so what I have in front of me, I think I explained that I'm classically trained in French wines. I think this is backwards to you as a, on the video, but it's a, a Grand Cru White Burgundy, uh, Chevalier Montrachet, which is one of the top estates. There's only six Grand Cru White Burgundies, and this is one of them. Um, it's from, mine is from the 2007 vintage. I think we have a tendency to drink our wines uh, too young as well. So I think if you can afford to put a few things away and drink them over time, that's why I recommend buying four bottles of an item or six. If you, if you know you like it, see how it progresses over time. So I think that's the key to try to not pinpoint where it will be its best, but if it keeps improving, you want a few bottles to have in a year or two or five or whenever you feel that if it's a red wine, if the tannins have been tamed a little bit and so forth. So uh, um, I think that's the key to um, enjoying wine is drink what you like with whatever you're eating. 
Um, I, I'm not a stickler. You know, I, I think people often say, well, I got to match up the wine with the food. I kind of disagree with that. I think you match up the wine with who's drinking the wine. I think that makes a little more sense because um, you go to some of these great restaurants and the Psalms will get together and they'll taste seven wines to decide what's going to work with this chef special of the evening. Now it worked for them, but it may not work for some of the people coming in for dinner. So that's why I urge you to be your own boss. Um, ratings are a benchmark. I think I don't put full trust in those only because they're someone else's opinion. But I mean, there's some great Robert Parker, there's some great producer, you know, uh, people that judge wine today. And it's a guide, but um, be your own boss, be your own guide with what you feel if, if it's drinking well now or you think it will improve over time. So um, a little bit on, I, I probably, I'm seeing a lot of California wines here, I think. So I'd like to spend a minute before we get into some of the questions. Um, on how we name our wines in America. And they are AVAs. That's the acronym for American Viticultural, these grape growing areas, AVAs. This is how we label. In France, we have Appellation Controle. In Italy, we have the DOC and DOCG. And uh, everybody has their own classification system. But in America, we use AVAs. So California is an ABA. So you may find something from a Gallo or a Kendall Jackson or someone that just has a California name on the label as the area of where the grapes came from. Um, that's good in one way and I'll tell you why. Because if, you, if you're a vineyard in uh, Alexander Valley and you have hail or you have a fire, there's been some devastating uh, climatic conditions lately, um, you're kind of lost. But if you're getting fruit from all over the state, this is what the big guys do. They blend. They blend grapes from different areas of the state, and that creates consistency. And I think that's what the big producers are after. They want it to taste the same as it, as it did last year. That's what a fair amount of uh, customers drinking wine want to see is that it does it taste the same as you grow and develop in your wine tasting uh, escapades you will see wow that vineyard really did well that little six acre plot uh, did so much better in 2015 than it did in 14 because of ripeness of the grapes or um, you know the acidity levels held in uh, held on to what they feel is important but um, I think it's important to understand where the grapes are sourced. So Robert Mondavi may be based in the Napa Valley, but he's purchasing his fruit from other parts of California for his Woodbridge program. He's passed away now, but um, I worked the harvest at Robert Mondavi one year, and that was uh, very interesting. My last 15 years I've spent in um, fermentation science, uh, biochemistry, microbiology of winemaking. So that's always intrigued me and I've had a chance to, to spend more time with it. But um, I think when you realize that um, people go beyond their plot of land sometimes and purchase grapes, there's a lot more farmers than there are wineries. There's a lot more grape growers than there are wineries. So um, I feel like I'm hogging the conversation here, but you know, I'm sure there's some feedback. So uh, Jill, should we move on to so open it? I think before we open it up, one of the things that we'd hoped you'd be able to do, and this will lead us into a few of the questions we have, is since most people have a glass here, could you just give us a little quick primer on how to taste your wine? Yeah, good point, my bad, <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I think the first thing you do, and you've all, all done this because we've been drinking for 30 minutes, but the first thing when evaluating wine is you look at the color. Now, this is a white wine with some bottle maturity to it, so it's deeper than a recently bottled Chardonnay from California would be, but you do look at color. If it's a red wine, is it, um, does anyone know what today is, by the way, what very famous wine day today is? Can someone raise their hand and we'll try to unmute you. The Beaujolais release. Beaujolais. Beaujolais Nouveau, exactly, exactly. 
So um, if you have a Beaujolais in front of you, that's a very lightly colored wine, low levels of pigmentation because of the Gamay grape. But if you have a Bordeaux, I see some Bordeaux here and I see Elevage and some of these, you're gonna have more pigmentation. So if it's a red wine, okay, I get it, but how, what is the intensity of that red color? You may, does that make sense? White wine, same thing. You may have something like a, a German wine or an Austrian wine perhaps, or uh, a Pinot Grigio from Italy. I know there's a Pinot Gris here, um, but, but yeah, those are lighter colors, less intensity. Oftentimes they don't have oak or it's old oak if it's there, but if you have a um, barrel fermented and a barrel aged uh, Chardonnay, let's say from Burgundy or anywhere in California, it's gonna have a deeper color. So we say white wine, we talk about uh, red wine. So there's different intensities of pigmentation, which is based on the grape variety. You know, all red wine gets its color from the grape skins. During the maturation process, this, the pigmentation starts leaching out of the skin and then it is absorbed into the wine. So you end up after three to four weeks with a full red wine. Pink wine is in the middle. Some people say you add red and white together. You can, and some people do that, but it's the more well-known way or the more predictable result way would be limited skin contact time with dark skin grapes. And that may be two days or three days. Um, Chuck, what do you use for your rosé? Can you unmute and what's your maturation time for we, uh, it's 100% 100 Cabernet Franc and it's cold soaked uh, yep. carbonic for about two, three days in, okay. a, in a cold room. Okay, good. Perfect. Great recipe for, so limited skin contact time. Everything he said makes tremendous amount of sense and he's very good at it. Um, so that's pink. Um, bubbles. Oh yeah, I want to, I get carried away. So after you have looked at the color of the wine and determined what the intensity of color is, always swirl wine. Wine is a living thing. It's carbon-based. It really doesn't like to be in the bottle. It likes to be in the glass or it likes to be in a decanter. So by swirling wine, you're allowing these volatile components to uh, evaporate. And I'm in an old world Chardonnay glass here. Um, so sometimes you will see the chimney uh, diameter really goes very narrow. That will focus. Pinot Noir glasses often will do that. Um, so after you have swirled the wine, then you go ahead and uh, smell it. And the nose should tell your brain what this wine should taste like. So um, have a sip. If you want to bring in a little bit of air, when you're sampling the wine, that again allows it to hit a lot of parts of the olfactory system. And um, probably most of you are drinking dry wines and hopefully you all know that a dry wine is something that's not sweet. Although I did have a question. Um, what is the best dry wine? That's a very difficult question to answer because everybody's a little bit different, but dry wines complement food. I think that's the starting point, unless you're drinking dessert wines with a dessert. Again, you wanna keep the meal in balance. So after you have looked at the wine, swirled the wine, smelled the wine, taste the wine, if it's a lingering aftertaste, that's usually favorable. If it's a quick finish, that's fine too, but you can evaluate the finish of the wine. Um, but I think most of you are drinking wines that are dry, therefore high in acid or low pH, which will really act as a palate cleanser so that when you taste that next bite of food, it will be like the first bite of food. I think that's the thing that people miss out on is um, the palate cleansing ability of a dry high acid wine, either red or white because if you have a bite of food and you really enjoy that, and then you have a sip of dry high acid wine, it cleanses the palate so that that next bite of food is enjoy as enjoyable as the first. So the palate cleansing ability of acid, acidity is a big component in wine, um, ends up and then you finish and wow, that's a lingering finish or it's a short finish or whatever terminology you want to use. 
But I think you want to have, you know, wine is made to, sure, on, on, on I live in Palm Beach, Florida, so it's always nice here, but um, the, um, you can see there's a pool wine and then there's a, a Chateaubriand red wine. So you got to really look at what you're doing, who you're with. Uh, I often hear stories of, oh, I went to France and I had this great uh, Sancerre and when I got ha home, I had the same bottle and it wasn't the same. Well, if you're in Europe on vacation, you're probably having some fun. You come home, the mortgage is due, the kids are yelling. Um, so it's your mindset is part of that equation too. So anything else you want to talk about, Jill, on the... Um... Uh, no, I think, I think that's great. I hope everyone's tasted and thought about it. And we've got a few questions coming in and we've got a few questions that were submitted that you haven't gotten to. So I think what I'd like to do is um, if you've submitted a question in advance, um, I'm going to give you a chance to ask your question directly um, of Gordon. So um, I will mention your name. Uh, if you're here, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask your question and join in the conversation. If you don't remember your question or you feel shy, just quickly shoot me a note in the chat and I will ask your question. Sure, on your yes, we don't want anybody to be shy here. We don't want anybody. And so with that, um, Gordon, this is a good opportunity, like we talked about, for you to go ahead and change your view to speaker view so that okay. you can feel like yeah. you're in a real conversation with whoever you're talking with. Okay. And um, I'm going to start with the some of the pre-submitted questions, but keep them coming in the chats because I will get to those as well. Um, and Gordon, once you've got your view set, if you could take another second and just jump into the chat. And um, we did have a question if you could uh, share the name of the wine that you're drinking. If you could just type type that in or type that into the chat. Oh, you want me to do that? Did you if you could, yeah, we've sure. had a question. It went by. Um, it went by a little too fast for us to capture it. Right. So just uh, we got Grand Cru, but we didn't get the rest. Um. All right, and so. The first person, and this kind of goes, um, Tammy, I'm gonna ask you to help me here too. If you can look at the participants and I'll uh, reference who asked the question and you can just kind of let me know if, if they're here and I'll move along if they're not. Perfect, thank you, Gordon. Mm -hmm. um, so Caroline Musicant, are you here with your question, which goes with very nicely with what we just talked about about the tasting? Tammy's looking, don't see her. Marichelle Joyner, we talked a little bit about food and wine pairings. If you're here, anything specific? Uh, Aska, you'd asked about difference between French, Italian, and US. I think we covered that. We've got a pretty broad question here from John, John Maselli. John here, making Tammy read the list really fast. Uh -huh. People with questions who missed the talk. Um, Okay, Mijinu, actually you are next. And um, if you'll unmute and go ahead and you can uh, have a conversation with Gordon about your question. Thank you very much. Thank you for doing this, Gordon. Um, do you have some comments on, on pricing of wines? Just general comments on, on wine pricing. Yeah, that gets complicated because there's so many moving parts, to be honest with you, but, um, and we have Chuck on board, which you have to look at the, there's a few channels of trade. We have the, uh, the wineries that actually produce the wine. They are going to farm the grapes. They're going to do the harvesting. They're going to be doing the uh, um, fermentation, the maturation. If it's a red wine, it's gonna be 18 months or two years in oak barrels. So all of those come into play um, in terms of pricing to the distributor. In America, we have what's called a three tier. Um, so the winery sells it to a distributor and that's what I was, I think. Chuck, I don't know if you're going direct uh, up there in, in the Finger Lakes, but there's a few ways to do it. But most of the country, so everyone gets their taxes, is it goes from producer, so they will sell it for $10. 
and then it comes to a distributor and they may sell it for 16 and then it's sold to a retailer that may sell it for uh, 21 and if it's a restaurant they'll sell it for 35 so there's a couple of hands in it that boost up the the price but that's how the the four channels of trade that are necessary before you put it on your table and then total wine you're going to go to total wine and buy it and they may it depends how they buy it so there's no ironclad regulation if if there's a a, a worldwide demand for your product, you can get a lot more for it. If it is a mass produced wine that you're looking for that consistency with a California ABA, um, you're probably gonna be pretty similar in your price points. And then if anything European or other currencies, you gotta look at it, the exchange rate, which plays a role too. So there's a lot of factors in that pricing. Did that answer the question? Yes, I mean, I think that it's, um, you know, a little bit of a confusing thing when you look at what you like versus the price, and it really doesn't necessarily always match up. No, it doesn't, um, no. Yeah, so, but that explains it. So do you want, do you want to drill it down any further, or did I kind of answer no, that? No, I mean, I think demand is probably an easy answer, but when we, okay. when we talk about, you know, um, just everyday price wines on every that we drink every day or yeah. you know that we're drinking on a regular basis looking at pricing really doesn't matter right it's not correct, correct. Yeah. yes you know that's the biggest misconception that people have it has to be expensive to be good and there's nothing further from the truth i think that's one reason that chile and argentina uh, parts of southern France, a lot of parts of Italy, they're making great wine at affordable pricing because they're not the big names or the big producers, which can get more money. It's uh, supply and demand is a huge part of the equation. Right. So, but I, I urge you to drink um, affordable wines on a nightly basis and then a special occasion wine, um, you know, if, if that occurs too. So, uh, but no, quality is not at all re related to quality. You just made my night, Gordon. Thank you. Pardon me? You just made my night, Gordon. <laughs> oh, okay, good, good, excellent. <laughs> okay, uh, John, John Booth, you're up next with your question. Hey, Gordon, thanks so much for doing this. This is my just pleasure. awesome. Um, I was going to ask a question about Burgundy. I, I didn't know that you knew it so well, but um, I, I, I'm going to just pivot just a little bit. If, if, if you could only drink one wine uh, from a certain region in the world, uh, which one would it be and why? This is me personally now you're talking yes, about. Yes, yes. It would be, I mean, I love champagne. I love, um, you know, there's a new, you know, everyone knows the big names in champagne now, but there's a trend now to go into what's called in French, récoltant manipulant, which is grower producers, where it's a small family owned five, 10 acre plot, and they do everything themselves. So I love what grower producers are doing in Champagne. I think the versatility of Champagne, but if you're really pigeonholing me into uh, uh, my category of choice, it would be Burgundy, red and white. You know, the um, ethereal, I, I just think the, um, the subtleties, the nuance, and that's, I was classically trained at the Breakers Hotel with Burgundy. You know, we had about 300 French wines and, um, I would say, so are you looking for one vineyard? Um, I, I mean, I could drill down a little more. I mean, are you talking white, red? What what region? Uh, what yeah, village well, okay. would, 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 would you? Go ahead. Sorry. So like Vaughn Romanet is, I mean, that's, every, that's like the most expensive wine. Is, is, that, is that something you would ever do or? Oh, sure. Well, um, let me take you one step further. Vaughn Romanet is the village where these six Grand Cru vineyards are located. So Bon Romanet, you can get a generic Bon Romanet, which is probably 80 or $90 a bottle. But if you want to get Romanet Conti or Romanet Saint Vivant or uh, Grand Achez, oh, any of these great producers, that's the vineyard plot. So yes, I think the value in Burgundy would be at the village level. Okay. So um, this is in the village, my Grand Cru is in the village of uh, Pouligny Montrachet. So I think to drink village wines makes the most sense in Burgundy. There are, one of the questions was, um, you know, some of these are outrageously priced and you're right. So you look for 
What the Burgundians are doing now is they are doing some just Bourgogne Blanc and Bourgogne Rouge, where they're blending these villages together. I'm not going to say you're going to get Premier Cru or Grand Cru fruit in it, but you will get overproduction village wines. And I think, you know, those sell for $25 a bottle. And there's some great producers playing that, that game right now, John. So I think that drink village level Burgundy. Um, I, I, Premier Cru would be a good step up and Grand Cru's are just ridiculous. You know? Well, that's great. Thank you. It would be great if you could give us like a name or two of a village. And then we yeah, well, Bon Romanet, the one you uh, so let's talk about a couple of reds first. Bon Romanet that you mentioned, absolutely. That's the jewel in the necklace. You know, that okay. is the, but if you go, uh, that's in the Cote de Nuit, the northern part, where you would also find villages like Chambol Musigny, a great mm -hmm. village name, the village of Bougeau, the village of um, uh, Nuit Saint Georges. And then if you come south in the, to the Cote de Bonne, you have Pomar. And uh, the other big one there would probably be Volnay. So those are like five or six villages of red that I'd recommend. Whites, the big three are Pouligny Montrachet, Chassagne Montrachet, and Merceau. Those, you can still get village wine in the 50, 40 to $50 range, but there's some satellite villages. There's about 45 villages in Burgundy. So something like Saint-Aubin or Saint-Romain, these would be more affordable villages for white wine in the Southern part. Great, thank you. Sounds like a Williston 2023 alumni tour, my friend. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> what are you drinking, John? What do you have in the glass? Uh, I'm, I'm drinking uh, Chachi, which is uh, relatively inexpensive, uh, Brunello, I love Italian wines, but it's yeah. 2010, so it's sort of nice. It has some age to it, um, so very lucky here. That's the key. Very good. Thank you for your comments. Listen, if uh, I can talk to everyone for a second, stemware is very important. You know, you can go out and spend money, a lot of money for wine or a little bit of money for wine. There's a brand that I think is as good as it gets, and that's Riedel. Riedel comes from Austria. It's engineered stemware. I do rec it's not going to make a pedestrian wine taste great, but it's going to make a good wine taste correct, is how I phrased it. I had the ch chance to go with George Riedel to seven of his factories in Germany and Austria, and there's nobody more dedicated to engineered stemware than the Riedel family. They do decanters, but uh, for example, this is a um, a old world Chardonnay glass. So my Grand Cru Burgundy is perfect. The chimney diameter works, but most of you would want to have a, board, uh, a Bordeaux glass like this. This is a large one. You don't need the real big one, but this, the, the chimney diameter and the bowl shape enables you to swirl wine. So I do recommend getting pretty good stemware. And Riedel, you can get at Williams Sonoma for six, $7 a stem. And you don't need 20 of them. They make probably 50, but you need one for white wine. You need one for Burgundy and Bordeaux, which would include Cabernet and Merlot. And so stemware is important. And champagne, right, Gordon? You need a champagne. Champagne, yeah. If I can spend a minute on champagne, a very misunderstood category as well. You know, back in the 60s, our family members would drink the Asti Spumanti in these little saucers. Now they use for sorbet in restaurants, but back in the day, those were what were, Asti Spumanti was in these things and served at weddings. So as champagne started to uh, gain in quality and, and popularity, they came out with this slender, uh, I don't have one with me here, but a slender, almost like a flute. And I must say, I'm not a fan of those because what it does, the, the chimney diameter up top, it runs pretty much um, cylindrical. It's the size of a 50 cent piece. And that does not allow you to pick up the aromatics. Uh, you, it's good for checking out bubble activity and the bubble dynamics is if it goes from the nucleation sites up to the top of the glass is wonderful. But you do want to put your better champagnes in a white wine glass. And I say that because 
if you're drinking some serious champagne, you want to really pick up the nuances of the village. There's 319 villages in champagne, and each one is kind of unique and different. So these grower producers that I mentioned earlier, these guys are really getting their fruit from a 10 acre plot. And you really want to pick up their nuanced elegance that the champagnes have. So I recommend if you, I'm not saying throw your flutes away because I often do these training classes at restaurants and the people will say, I always say, if someone's buying a more expensive, a bottle of champagne, give them the choice. Would you like it in the traditional champagne flute or would you prefer it in the trending white wine glass where you can pick up the nuances and subtlety of the terroir? You know, that's, yes. Jill, something else? Um, okay, let's see. Um, is Maggie Spurrier on the call? Okay. Uh, Bruce Hoffman? Oh, Bruce, I think we talked about this. Bruce was asking what color is good to drink. I think we're pretty clear that on if you like it, it's good to drink. Um, Paul Fedorkowitz, are you on with us? Robert Dannon's got an interesting question. Class of 69, a classmate is here yes. on the call. Bob Dannon, where are you, buddy? Yeah, Bob. hi, I, I, I confess that I had to go to the yearbook. <laughs> you know, I, that's you know, well, I knew you. I, 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 I didn't know you well, but um, you were the good looking preppy guy there, I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um, I spent the last uh, 20 years or so uh, drinking wines in the summer in Chianti, and I wanted to know uh, where your place in Rada is, what the, uh, what the vineyard oh, okay. is, and what you're making. Very good. Okay. Um, I'm just a partner, and it's more of a business relationship than it. I, mean, I go over a lot, but. It, there's two um, owned by the same gentleman. The guy lives in Palm Beach, but he um, bought these two properties in Rada. One is Casavento and the other is Libranando. So they're both in Rada, in the city of Rada, and um, they're both mountain uh, or hillside, pretty good hillside. But um, they do the Super Tuscans, they do Chianti Classico, Reserva, uh, they do some white, white blends and so forth. What do you think of the Super Tuscans? I think, well, first of all, it's a great category. And I think anything with super in front of it attracts a lot of people. Uh, although I don't think it's a kind of misunderstood category. Um, so I think to, you really don't know what you're getting there. You would think if it's a super Tuscan wine, it would have uh, Sangiovese in it. Um, it doesn't have to. I know some 100% if you're drinking Ornelai or Sasakai, I mean, there's Cabernet Franc, there's Merlot, there's any number of things in addition to, or not even including Sangiovese. So I love the category. I think it, there's from $10 a bottle to $400 a bottle. So it's just people don't really get it in, on, in honesty. And the other thing that's confusing is that Gran Selezione, have you tried any of those from Tuscany? It's a Chianti no. Classico, but Gran Selezione is the very best that they right. can produce. So people don't understand that either, but Gran Sele Great Selection is a good term to see on a label. So you have to own the land, you can't purchase any fruit. But no, I love what Super Tuscans are doing, but I don't think people know what they're getting, in all honesty. Yeah, um, my place is in uh, San Donato. Oh, you so I one. stick oh. pretty close to home. Do you know okay. Nicola Caramelli at La Ripa? Okay, sure, okay. He's yeah. producing a, an organic uh, Classico Reserva. Okay. And so what is your opinion of the, of the organic wines that are coming out of the Chianti? Well, I think it's a good move because if you look at pre-World War II, everybody was doing organic because we didn't have the herbicides and fungicides and so forth that we have um, you know, eliminated the more natural approach. So I love anything organic, I think. And then there's steps beyond that. Rudolf Steiner did his uh, biodynamic. biodynamic thing, which some people in Italy are doing more up in the, the Dolomites and the you know, area in the Northeast. But um, no, I, I think that organic makes a tremendous amount of sense. It's a more natural approach to winemaking. It's more labor intensive and it can or usually costs a little more money, but I think it's, you know, they're stewards of the land. And I think that's the key to, uh, 
either organic or biodynamic or whatever. And there's a lot of them that are, aren't often even organized. In America, they're all over the place in terms of organically farmed, organically grown grapes, organic, biodynamic. There's a lot of terms out there and there's a lot of certification people. So I think that's a confusing part of the wine industry too. Have you been to the new uh, uh, Antonori place? Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Yeah, Piero is a good friend of mine. And I think that it's, I mean, it's probably avant-garde for you, I'm guessing. I don't no, know. No, I love but... it. I, I okay, love it. good, good. Um, I no, I think that it. Italy, now, are you in the wine business or? No, what, well, not at all. Okay, you just. I'm in the drinking, drinking okay, wine good. business. We like people like you. <laughs> good, well, keep drinking. Um, are you getting down to Brunello at all? And um, Yeah, sometimes, or, but, yeah. you know, um, I'll, I'll, try, I'll DM you and. Maybe the next time I'm over there, we'll uh, we'll meet up. Okay, very good. 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 Thanks for like, doing this. Okay. I feel like we could have a, we could have a whole night on Italian wines here. This is opening up a whole new uh, thought process for me. Well, um, I've read that Italy has one million farms, so you try to decipher. That more. <laughs> that's Two. huge, and there's five thousand grapes. I mean, it's it's crazy how Italy is the entire country most. Other countries is parts of the country. All 20 states, if you will, in Italy make wine, including the islands, Sardinia and Sicily. It sounds like it sounds like a good a good class in Italian wines. I'm gonna be back to you on that. Um, Jesse Robinson, are you on the call, Jesse? Okay, Doug Elder. I think I saw you, Doug. There you are. You have to unmute. Go ahead and unmute your call. Uh, hit the space bar. Can you, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can. How are you? Okay. I uh, was just had a, a bottle of Lost Cock in Australia, Mendoza. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Uh, there's a bunch. Um, if it's Mendoza, it's Argentina. Did you say Australia, yeah. though? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. These are uh, kind of fuzzy there. No, I don't know it. You know, there's the, Australia, Aus, uh, Argentina. There's so many new. They're going in, in uh, Argentina. They're going up the Andes Mountains for elevation. So they're ripening other grapes higher up. And uh, But no, I think the Southern Hemisphere wines are terrifically priced and you get a bang for your buck you get a uh, good color you get moderated alcohol you get tannin levels that are uh, adequate and okay. um, i stay with it because it's a very productive area and there's always new vineyards coming so keep experimenting okay thank you okay certainly i know um, that bottle wasn't open though <laughs> <laughs> well, he had and it before. He's on a second bottle. Doug's, Doug's original question too was uh, asking you what you thought about Alexander Valley wines. Oh, very good question. Yeah, Alexander, you know, everyone in California talks about Napa Valley. And Napa Valley is only about 30 miles long by three or four miles wide. And uh, there's 400 wineries in there. I own 17 acres of vineyards in Napa several years ago. But um, there's, it's a limited resource and very, very expensive. There's no, there's very few affordable wines coming out of Napa Valley anymore. It's only 4% of California production, but everyone's heard of it and they know it, but it's a very small percentage of the total production. Alexander Valley is in Sonoma and Sonoma is probably twice or even three times the size of Napa. So you've got diversity you know, you have the Russian River Valley, which is good for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, but Alexander Valley is good for the red varietals like Cabernet Sauvignon and Zinfandel. So I think Alexander Valley, you're getting essentially Napa Valley quality for a half or a third the price in some instances. So I love Alexander Valley. There's some Ferrari Carano is based out of there. There's, there's some great producers in Alexander Valley, and I highly recommend people experimenting with it. Good. Thank right. you. Certainly. All right. Next question from another classmate, uh, Jim Fisher. We're going to throw it over to oh, you. It's very Fisher. different, but equally. Well, the name from the past questions. there. How are you, Jim? Yeah. How are you, Gordy? Good. Thank you. 
We've all changed, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, and I'm just listening to the uh, early part of your life journey. It, it's interesting to think about how concentrated we all were at Williston, and then we we went all yes. these different directions. And yeah. I love. What do you end up doing, Bob? What do you end up doing? What have I been doing? Yeah. Just quite well, right down. right now I'm uh, working on setting up an organic farm operation in Togo, Africa. Good for you. Hopefully there'll be a story to tell in about a year on that front. But now vegetable, what are you what are you producing there? What do you intend on well, producing? Well, we're uh, we're one of my questions to you was is there any wine being grown in Africa? Mm -hmm. Um you know, we're focused primarily on vegetable, but we want it to be right. a a regenerative agriculture. Okay. Uh, so it's organic, but uh, we're partnering with the Rodale Institute in uh, Pennsylvania to try to design a, uh, an operation that can be a model for okay. other Africans, but that's, that's not really related to wine. The question I have for you, I, I was out at a ski resort in Aspen a while, or out in Colorado a while ago, and I remember reading about these restaurants that were paired, that were suggesting different strains of marijuana with different types of food. Okay. And I'm wondering if there's anything underway to, to try to pair wine with different strains of marijuana. Does anybody have conversation about those things? You know, I think it's something that's Colorado or Hopland, California yeah. or Eugene, Oregon. I think it's in the little pockets where you're gonna find that. It's not mainstream enough yet to go yeah. But I think, no, I think it has like coffee beans or chocolate, you know, the sources of where these things come from play a role in um, what you're looking for in terms of, you know, potentials of, of flavor profiles or what kind of buzz you're looking for. I don't really know, but no, they're playing the game, but I think it's very localized. Yeah. Um, so. But I think it, it becomes a distortion too, in terms of I mean, it's a, probably a fun evening, but I think there's some distortion of perceiving yeah. wine. You know, if you're looking for the nuances of wine, maybe uh, I've never really had this conversation with anybody, so I'm kind of skimming over it. But no, I, I think you're going to dilute one of the other with it. I don't know. But yeah, I tend to think that the metal state may end up being more wandering in nature and not really allowing you to fully focus on the wine. and experience. Okay, right, right. And, but your and question on Africa, um, the wineries, they're primarily in Cape Town, around the southern part. Okay. Um, you know, there's several regions, and after apartheid, a lot of individuals came in and started farming. The KWB, the big, the big one, which was government controlled, that did everything in those early days. But now it's these amazing wines coming out of South Africa. You know, Stellenbosch and there's some great, the Dutch had settled there, of course, and then they, uh, they brought farming techniques with them, but they, they really adopted world-class winemaking in South Africa today. Mm -hmm. And there's so many choices. There's, you know, there's probably, I'm guessing 25, 30 major regions within it. And then the Pinotage is one of their popular red grapes and then Steen or Chenin Blanc is one of their popular whites, but they're melding into the vinifera from Europe, you know, for sure. So I mm -hmm. think it's, uh, but, uh, you know, your area, if you have the soil that works and you may want to plant an acre and see what it does for you, you know, it, things have to come into place. There needs to be the nutrients in the soil and there needs to be uh, adequate sunshine and and either if you're not irrigating, you need to have rain. So, I mean, there's a lot of things, but if you're doing other things, give it a shot. Plant an acre or something. Mm -hmm. How far are you from Cape Town, let's say? Oh, it's a good distance. Uh, yeah. Togo's, uh, um, if you think of the bump out of Africa in the Atlantic Ocean, oh, Togo's okay. on the south side of that bump out, Ivory okay. Coast, Benin area. Well, that's a thousand miles or whatever. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a good, it's, it's right on the equator. And I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure that that, uh, Climate. Well, latitudinally, most of what grows worldwide, both northern hemisphere and southern, is between the 30th and 50th degree. Mm -hmm. now, Chuck's wine is right at that 49th, probably, but, uh, you know, Germany is there, and on the southern hemisphere, New Zealand, uh, southern Chile, those are pushing the envelope for grape ripening, too. So, but it's between the 30th and 50th is where the big belt of where grapes grow to make wine. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. Um, Pete Linkram, are you here? I'm going to start moving through the chat questions. Pete. Yes, we're here. Hey, how are you? Wife that had the question, so I'll let yeah. her ask it. Hi, I'm. Hi. I'm, uh, I'm married into Williston, so hi. My name okay, is. Okay, very good. Well, You're so accepted. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it. So um, my question is, I, you know. Um, I am a very casual wine drinker, so I just kind of get whatever is put in front of me, but I right. always find I have trouble when I'm going to a dinner party or I need a hostess if I never know what wine to take. So is there any recommendation or any way to even um, just decide when I go into a wine shop, it feels really overwhelming. Yes, I follow. I follow. Um, so something that has wide appeal that I could stock up on to take as hostess gifts or if I go to a dinner party? Okay, very good question. And if you can find out kind of what they drink, if they're Pinot Noir drinkers or if they're Riesling drinkers or Cabernet or Meritage, whatever, if you can find that out, that will help. Um, but I think bubbles are something that works as a great gift. Now, people view home gifts two different ways. Someone open it up with you there and others want to have it when you go home, you know, not that night necessarily, but they want it for future. So I think bubbles are a no brainer. You know, I think that's something that it turns an average night into celebratory. Um, so I think that's a very safe bet if you want to, and it doesn't have to be champagne. It can easily be a sparkling wine from um, California or Oregon or Washington state or um, I know Chuck does two uh, skews of, of bubble Moscato and Riesling, I guess. Um, so it just turns an average night into a better night for the, those that are getting it. But, you know, rosé is a popular gift. You know, if it's summertime, where do you get, where do you guys live? What state? We live in Maryland. Maryland, okay. So you, you know, I think the northern part of the country drinks more red wine than Florida or Texas or Arizona or Southern California. So I think probably just inherently they're more, it's more of a red wine drinking area because when it gets cold, you know, you want to have something with some body or some power to it. So, you know, Cabernet is a no brainer. Um, you know, and your price point doesn't matter what the gift comes from you and it shouldn't have a price tag that's, it doesn't have to be a $30 bottle. It doesn't have to be a $50 bottle. It can be a Chilean wine that's $15. And believe me, I, I think people get hung up on, we're gonna bring something real expensive and you don't, you know, you don't. don't have it. Broad brush statement, but bubbles is the no brainer. Great, all right, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate okay. it. Certainly. Well, another answer on your question though, um, and Gordon, you're probably familiar with, uh, what's her name? Madeline uh, Paquette and winefolly.com. Oh yes, yeah, terrific book. Yep. A great website that takes yes. a lot of the serious pretension out of wine. Yep. And she, she does a poster called, How to Choose a Bottle of Wine, that's hilarious. Okay, you, I think you can go I've on her website that. and check it out. Okay, uh, okay. That's, and that's winefolly.com? Yep. Yeah, she's yes. very good. She's come out with a uh, soft cover and a hard cover edition now, so. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Amazing. Good. Okay, let's see. So continuing and, and uh, shifting gears a little bit, John McGowan. John, you with us? I am here. Yep. Hey, John. Hi, how are you? So um, kind of same career path that you've had uh, was based in the on-premise world for quite some time and then transitioned to sales. Uh, okay. The difference between your SOM experience now I'm currently pursuing a WSET uh, educational path, but what was your experience like going through the Psalm? Because I avoided it as best as I could. Yeah, and that's okay. But it's, I think, and now there's been two bad stories about Psalm. Right. So I think that it's it may need to have a correction here. Um, not that there's some very great ones and there's it's been a calling card for a lot of people, but they were had a high wave and now I think with the two scandals lately, it's not good. But anyway, I think WSET, I sat for the advanced. I was the lead wine steward at the Breakers Hotel, but this was back in the 70s. And the, I mean, I, I think the court was in London, but it didn't go beyond that. So it wasn't even in my wheelhouse. Fred Dame was one of the first ones in the mid 80s, but I was selling wine in the 70s. And 
all you had to do was at the on-premise level was to be able to, I memorized the wine list of 400 items and I approached the table with confidence and, but I was only there for five years. Then I switched to the distributorship where I sold to restaurants and hotels and private clubs. So I think my experience, so you've morphed into that now? You've gone I have, from, yeah, okay. I have. So um, I was with a, a couple different, one based out of California restaurant group and then also coming back to Rhode Island where I'm from, uh, a larger restaurant group here and okay. then transitioned onto the sales side of things where I've been for nine years, so. Fine, with a distributor or? With, with a distributor. Uh, oh, fine, yeah. okay, good. Um, no, I think as far as the certifications go, WSET is good, CORT is good, um, CWS is good. They're all good. Um, I just think it gets you focused into, um, you know, spending time being able, you want to be able to answer questions that your buyer will have. And I think with your restaurant background, you're probably already there and spending what, eight or nine years in distribution, right. you probably have a pretty good feel. You're in the on-premise division now too at the distributorship, right? We cover both. In, in Rhode Island, we're allowed to cover both. So and I do what do you do? Own. What do you do? You so I'm in a fine wine, division, uh, right. fine wine division within a company, Horizon Beverage. Good. Okay. And you do on and off? On and off. Yep. Okay, good. So that, off now and off. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. <laughs> Um, no, keep, keep studying. I think the court probably carries a little more weight, but W said is coming on very strong. Um, so it's, it teaches you how to focus in on, I don't think blind tasting makes a lot of sense to be on honest with you. I, I sat for the advanced, I just didn't have time, but I passed the advanced theory and, um, service because I came from the breaker. So I, I passed both of those, but the blind tasting, it never made sense to me, to be honest with you, but right. it's part of the regimen now. So you got to blind taste and identify aromatics or flavor profiles or oak treatment or whatever your acidity, whatever you're looking for. So keep studying. I, I wouldn't say um, go where your friends are. You know, if you have a couple friends at the company or if your company is sponsoring uh, classes for WSET or court, it doesn't matter, but you're going to have to be in a tasting group, especially if you want to go on to advanced or even to master. Okay. Um, so you, you're going to need a group that you get together weekly if you can, or every other week, if you can, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's, uh, it takes time. It takes money. Um, I studied for five years in addition to my normal everyday routine, just to take the exam so right. keep studying get the journals that each organization but go where your friends are at this point in time sure They're both good the, the big two are w set and quartermaster some of these great thank you okay what are you drinking uh chimney rock elevage oh good okay yeah. you represent that in rhode island i do yeah we we carry the trillot part of the trillot portfolio okay. right no she's a great winemaker she's a terrific oh, you met awesome. her yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, good she stuff. She went to, um, was it Vassar? Maybe she went, she went to a great school and then she, she's been there for 12 or 15 years now, I think. So. Yeah, we did a virtual um, educational piece with her a couple months back. I mean, that's that's yeah. kind of been our lives for a while since the yeah. whole shutdown with a lot of different winemakers and, and such, but she was awesome, so. Yeah, she, terrific lady, terrific lady. Yeah. Very, very, uh, and she's got a beautiful winery. Chimney Rock is a- uh, Can't beat it, it's iconic. Well, good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Is a good, a good transition to the next uh, question from Nancy Kuhn. Nancy, are you here with us? Nancy? Okay. See here we can... are. I'm here. Sorry. Oh. That's okay. My mother married into the Williston family. Okay. Uh, and this is great. So interesting. The yeah. mention of California a while ago reminds me of all of the fires that have happened on the West Coast in California, Oregon, and, and that Pacific Northwest area. And I wondered, do you think that that is likely to negatively affect the quality of the wines coming out of that region? And if so, you know, for how long should we anticipate that as a problem? It is a problem, especially for the current vintage. The 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 vine itself is pretty resilient, but if there's any fruit left on, it pick up picks up this uh, smoke taint 
Australia had the problem about 15 years ago, but people aren't even, this is like the third major fire now that either Pacific Northwest or Northern California, even Southern California has had. So they, um, they won't even, if the fruit is in to the winery, that's good. That's a great sign because you're not going to get and the winery stays <laughs> without burning too. I mean, there's been some devastating, you know, Newton, there's been some great wineries that have been just leveled with these fires and it's a horrible thing. And I think the third or fourth time it's happened. So it's usually, there may be some, if the fire hoses come in, it could um, let that ash settle into the soil a little bit, but it's usually not, the next year things are kind of back to normal. Um, Maybe there's a little different grape selection by these people, but uh, if it's already inside the winery and fermenting or aging, they're okay. It's just the stuff that's left on the vine for that year is the biggest problem. But the vines themselves are resilient. In light of the timing of the fires, do you anticipate that there would have been a lot left on the vines? When the fire um, happened, or do you have any way of knowing? Well, I mean, I think you have to look at each, you know, I'm, I get the three fires mixed up, but I think it was not, a lot of the fruit was in, I mean, a very broad brush statement, but I think a lot of people got their fruit in. For some reason they're in, you know, harvesting can occur in August or September, you know, at the latest in, uh, in California, perhaps, um, in Oregon is a little cooler, but Washington is a little warmer. So I think that um, a lot of the fruit was in, which is a good sign for people. I think that but, was true. I think that was true in California because the, the last round of fires were um, in late October and early November, really. Yeah, so. yeah. Thank you. Certainly. Um, okay, Persis, you have a question. Hey. Hi, um, my question was about decanting wines um, yes. because I've heard a lot from people saying that like you can improve any crappy bottle of wine by decanting <laughs> it. Um, but my question, actually my boyfriend's question was, can you actually ruin a bottle of wine by decanting it? Um, are there situations where you don't want to do that or does it generally help? Um, okay. Or just what, what, what you think about that in general? All very good questions, uh, all relating to decantation. I think they're, they're well phrased and each one deserves a little bit of time. Um, there are two purposes to decant. One of them is for older wine, separating the sediment from clear wine. So as wine ages, you know, the tannin levels uh, form solid sediment. So what happens, the, the, the tannin molecules polymerize and they get heavy, so they settle down to the bottom of the bottle, or if the bottle is laying down, it settles to the, to the bottom part. I threw it up here so you can see it. That's why it's good to lay your bottles down if you are going to have a lot of age on them, because you want to take it out of the horizontal position, open it in the horizontal position so you're not disturbing the sediment. But a lot of people don't have uh, are, are, unless you've inherited something from your parents, you probably don't have a lot of sediment in bottles today. The average lifespan of a bottle of wine consumption after purchase is a day and a half. So this polymerization of the tannin molecules takes 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so that is separating the tannin or the uh, solidified tannin, which is called sediment. So that's poured slowly over a candle into the intermediate vessel. That's one. The other is to take a young wine and let it aerate. So in other words, just opening the top of a bottle, you have this quarter size hole, that's not gonna aerate the wine. So ideally you can get that into the stemware at the table, or you can pour it into a decanter and that way the whole bottle gets aerated. Um, Oxygen is an enemy for wine until you get to service time. You know, and I think once it's either in the decanter, um, it's benefiting. So each wine is going to improve um, with aeration because it doesn't, it's a living thing, it's carbon based, it really doesn't like to be in the bottle. So by aerating it, you're letting it mature more rapidly to enjoy more at dinner. 
So if it's a big, bold, tannic wine, you want to get that into a decanter or at least into the glassware, into the stemware. Your other question, I think, was can you ruin a bottle? Um, you can, but it has to be one of those very old, the 1929 Chateau Margaux is too dainty. It's, it's too fragile to go through decantation. So that is something where you can injure the wine. But if it's a recently bottled big Cabernet or big Italian wine that needs time to aerate, it's beneficial. So I think uh, aeration, I'm a big fan. My, in, my invention is, ha has to do with aeration. I don't know if you were on at the beginning, but I've invented this in-bottle wine aerator under a screw cap. So when it's poured, it creates this vortex of flow and does aeration into the glass. So I'm a big fan of aeration, decantation, and getting into to stemware. Thank you very much. Is any, did I, I know you had a few things, but did I hit them all? Yeah, I think so. Okay. That was helpful, thank you. Keep decanting, keep decanting. <laughs> so how about this question? Could you talk a little bit about appropriate temperatures to serve different wines up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the key with, uh, again, you drink it at the temperature you like, but if we look at white wines or pink wines or bubbles, you know, the average refrigerator is around 34 degrees, a little bit above freezing. So your, your milk is cold, your water is cold. So that's a temperature that works for white wine. Um, that can be cold for some people if it's fragile. But I think drinking, um, that's a very personal thing. Is this Anthony that's on or still you, Jill? This is me so far, still me. Okay, sorry, Anthony's name came up there. Um, no, I think to, to drink it, if, if you feel that you, there's two, two temperatures, there's a storage temperature and a serving temperature. So I think your storage temperature, like I have my cellar set at 55. So that's a pretty good service temperature. Some may even say it's a little cold, 57 could be better, 58. But if wine is too warm, the alcohol becomes pronounced. So I think you have to say, okay, if your refrigerator is set for uh, 34 and you need to put it on the counter for 15 minutes prior to service, you gotta see what temperature works for you. And everybody's different. I would like to say that, I like wine a little bit colder, but some would say that there's a tendency to um, mute the aromatics, if they are fragile aromatics. So I think that uh, white wines stored at whatever you feel, but service temperature should be probably in the 30s or maybe the 40s. Red wines, you want to be in the high 50s. Now, if you have a little wine rack on your counter and it's 78 degrees, there's not much you can do. You drink it at 78. So service temperature, bubbles need to be cooler. Uh, pink wines and whites could be that 36 to 40, whatever you feel, uh, but reds are uh, in the 50s. If, if th those are ice cold, you don't get any of the aromatics on them. So when storing your wines, is it more important the temperature that you store them at or the consistency of the temperature that you store them at? Um, two very good questions. It depends how long you would have it, but I think the consistency of temperature is important. Okay. You know, mine's at 55 all the time. And um, so when I pull one out, um, it has time to warm, to, to, as the French say, to chambre, to let it come up to your room temperature. And at some point in time, it's going to be exactly where you want it. And then if you need to put that in the, lay it on the top of some ice briefly to bring it down six or eight or 10 degrees, it's, it's all individual, Joe. I wish I could say it as a blank statement, but... It's no, how you I, like I, it. I, I like your prescription that just about everything about wine is better if it matches your individual taste. Without question, without um, question. Two more, one specific question, two more sort of general questions and just a request for anyone who has any outstanding questions to pop them into the chat quickly. We have about 10 or 15 more minutes of Gordon's time. Um, or I'll stay if you want. I, I, if you want to stay, I'm... Prepared. Questions coming, pour another glass. 
Um, yes. Question about uh, your aerator cap that you mentioned. Is this something oh. that it could be purchased by individuals or is this something that you're creating for uh, mass production of wine? Well, <laughs> it's, in the, it's in the manufacturing stage right now. It's been five years in production and manufacturing. Anyone that does manufacture knows it's not easy or quick. So I think we're in the last generation. It will be available for winery insertion on the bottling line under screw cap or we are working on a retail piece with 10 or 12 uh, aerators in it in a plastic bag. Though. So when you take something at home, you can remove the cork and put it in or just undo the screw cap and put it in yourself. So we're looking at both channels of trade for winery insertion and aftermarket. Um, okay, oh, another question. Six months away. Um, another question is, is there a way to store an opened bottle of champagne that hasn't been finished or store an open bottle of bubbles? Not that I can ever imagine that happening. I know. You, you first of all, you shouldn't let it go more than one night, but no, they have these champagne tops, which kind of hook onto the bottom lip of the bottle and that will keep the CO2 level appropriate for another couple of days actually. So just get these champagne toppers and they, you put a little pressure on the top and then the arms hook under the rim and that the next day you got to be careful because it can pop. It depends how much wine is left in the bottle. But um, the, the champagne recorkers, if you will, or champagne tops are what I'd recommend. And then a more general question, what do you think about Portuguese wines? It's probably one of the areas that we didn't really touch on. No, we didn't. And Portugal, you know, every country, there's so many countries now making great wine. They're having resurgence in, in production and quality. And, and Portugal is one of those countries. If we look up north, um, you know, the Vino Verde and the Alvarinhos and Albarinhos, there's some great red and whites coming out of Portugal. So they are, there's some that are very affordable and they're somehow the very expensive. So I think that you just sort, sort of, although they are old world and they are grapes you have not heard of. For the most part, you don't get you know, the Cabernet and Pinot Noir, you don't get those. You get the Portuguese indigenous grapes there for the most part. So it does take a little bit of homework on your part to determine a flavor profile that works for you. But Toriga, the big wine coming out of Portugal, of course, the most famous is Port. And that's a high alcohol sweet wine. So it's served at the end of the meal. But there's Ruby Ports and Tani Ports and Aged Tani. There's a lot of categories. But there's still wines. They're doing pinks. They're doing whites. They're doing reds. They're doing, but you haven't heard of the grapes for the most part, unless you've made a study of Portuguese wines. So you've, you've, we've, we've referenced pink wines, white wines, red wines, green wines. What about orange wines? I see okay. those now. Orange wine has two terms. One, people think, oh, it's made from oranges. Um, no, that's not exactly right. But orange is sort of a trending category today. It probably had its origins in Greece or Mesopotamia or where they would have skin contact with, you know, if you look at grapes, they're either green or red or purple or something. And in order to get a red wine, you need to have skin contact with these red wines, uh, with these red grape skins to get the full color, the, the uh, leaching out of the pigmentation. Um, orange wines are skin contact with the white grape variety. So it picks up this amber color, if you will. It's kind of a, not many people know about it. It's a very psalm driven category. Um, I think it's had, I don't know, it's had its, day and 15 minutes of fame now, but it was popular four or five years ago. I'm sure some of the metro areas, but everything's different now. I mean, the New York City restaurants, they embraced it and, um, you know, the Somme driven San Francisco's, but that's all changed. So I don't know where the orange wine category is now, but it's a misunderstood category. Um, but they're natural wines and th those type of people love the category but they're not made from oranges, which a lot of people think. Um, okay, uh, we have uh, um, Marich Marichelle, I hope I'm saying your name right. If, are you here? Um, you have a question you popped in late with. 
Do you want to join the call or want me to ask? I oh, I think we're having trouble with your sound. So I'm going to ask your question. Um, we talked a little bit about this, but Gordon, if you had to, um, let me, I'll just, I'll just sort of, um, we're coming into the holiday season. Can mm -hmm. you recommend your top sort of your, your, your favorite meal wine pairings? What would okay. you, someone's asking for wine pairings. So food wine pairings, what would you pair with a delicious Turkey. feast for the holidays? Okay. Well, I think um, the thing about, you know, everyone talks about Thanksgiving and um, in the past, we've had a lot of people and a lot of food on the table. I don't know what's going to happen this year, but um, there was always, you know, the turkey and 25 other things. So my advice to anybody on any kind of a celebratory evening would be just to litter the table with diversified wines. I think you want to Riesling on there, you want a Pinot Noir, you want a uh, uh, Bubbles maybe at the beginning, but I just think you put a lot of choices and let people just take their own and pour. You know, I think you don't want to, because you have the cranberry sauce here and then you got the stuffing and then you have the turkey and there's just so much going on and so many people have different, you know, uh, preferences with their wine. Just put two or three or five wines on the table and let people choose. Is there, I, mean, I can say that Pinot Noir works well with, with turkey, rosé works well with turkey, uh, but it's these other components that add complexity to that event. That's why I think diversified flavor profiles make sense. And is there a right way to start? Start with bubbles, move to wine? Yes, and light and delicate at the beginning, yes. So I think if you're having guests over, I guess no more than 10 now, but um, you wanna start with bubbles when they come is ideal. And then if you're sitting down, if you're doing butler past hors d'oeuvres or something like that, you may want to do a, a white wine there. But if they're just sitting down right away, you have your pink and white and red on the table and let them, you know, if the host wants to ask, which would you like, the host can pour, but they can pour them themselves too. But I think you need a Pinot. I think that works well in the holiday season because it's not a overly tannic red wine um, but it's got some nice red fruit characteristics on the nose. And um, I think, you know, a Chardonnay is a no brainer. Everyone loves Chardonnay. Um, I think Sauvignon Blanc is a very food friendly white grape variety, uh, both in America and in the Loire Valley in France and white Bordeaux use that as well. So I think Sauvignon Blanc is a very exciting grape that works very well with food. Due to the low pH. Hey, hey Jordan, at the beginning of your presentation, you said you got where you are with a lot of reading. Yes. And um, this question leads to a book that I have in my hand, which my sister gave me, what, five, six years ago? It's in our kitchen. It's a favorite, and it's called. Oh, yeah, I love that book. I have it. I've got two copies of that, actually. So this um, book, no. This book, if you go through it, it has all of the common foods we might yeah. want to eat, like group. Yeah, the front or half is food and the back half is wine. So you can mix and match. No, I love that book. So I think that could, and I think you look up turkey and then it will have cranberry sauce. No, that's a great book. I think it's a very handy book to have. It belongs in the kitchen. You're right. Um, now, what do you guys do on Thanksgiving? You have your sparkling Moscato and yeah, Muscat Canelli you have, or what is it that you make? You mean all two of us this year? Yeah, uh, yeah I know, I know. <laughs> uh, we're fans of Rosé, we're fans right. of Gamay, you know, okay. light valley, uh, Good. high acid red, and um, some white, we'll figure some sort of white out there, but anyway. Okay, it's you're doing a, a Pinot one. Gris, I know, you're doing a Pinot Gris, yeah. and a Sauvignon Blanc. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Is it too cold there for Sauvignon Blanc? No, it's just, you know, planting decisions. You've owned vineyards. Yep. Uh, yep. They're pretty long-term decisions. Uh, yes, they are. The staff wants us to plant Albarino. And Good. interestingly, tomorrow night at five o'clock, Karen O'Neill in her little blog world, yeah, 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 doing uh, part two of an Albarino tasting with a psalm, I don't remember who it is. And, you know, it's one of those people in your world who yep. are really great at, at teaching us all. Mm -hmm. And so we're still, 
weighing whether we should go down that path? Well, I think that it's still a grape that's not on the tip of everybody's tongue, I must say. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think that um, in Portuguese, it's Alvarinho, in Spain, it's Albarinho. So, I mean, that's sort of a narrow focus, but I think the flavor profile could work for you up there in the Finger Lakes. I think that, um, so what, if you're you gonna cross, are you gonna graph something over or you got a whole new venue plot or what, how are you doing it? Well, we don't wanna bore the rest of the folks, but there is a grower in, in Sawmill Creek and we are actually obtaining wood this week. Oh, okay. And the plan is to graft it to, uh, I forget which rootstock and then work through it. It wouldn't go in the ground until the spring of 2022. Okay. Yeah, yeah long term, like you said. But is there anyone else up there doing it? Yes. Okay. And so can you buy place. fruit for one year? Can you buy someone's fruit for one year and try it? If it's available, we could, yeah. And we're actually drinking other people's wines. They are different than those that come from Spain. Your estate. But uh, anyway. We, we're wondering if it's a thing. Well, you know, I think it's going to be, what percentage are you doing over the counter at the winery? What percentage of sales is that for you? 50 to 60%. Okay. And the rest is going to New York restaurants? It's distribution. Yep. Okay, and Albarino would not be in distribution. That'd be hand sell. But that's okay, because when you're in the tasting room, you've won these people over, you know, on by the, here's our Pinot Gris, and by the way, this is our new Albarino, and I think you'll enjoy it, and they'll go out with two bottles. So I think that if you like the flavor profile of the grape, and your climate and soil works, um, run with it. Yeah, yeah. Have you tried Gruner Feltliner or anything like that, any of the... Um, Austrians? There are a number in our region who do grow it. We don't. Uh, we, we enjoy it. Um, you know, there are a lot of Gruner fans. So yep. anyway, thanks for the blessing. <laughs> You're going to send me a bottle in 2025 or whatever. You're going to do oak at the end? Or what do you think? And stainless steel and then a little oak or what? Or all stainless? I have no idea. I'm just going to do a tasting tomorrow night. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, that'll give you, and they'll give you that background of what the treatment, what the evolution, get, how they get to the final product. Yeah. So, um, Chuck, can I ask you to please um, put the title of that book and the author into the chat? Because we'll save the chat and I think people would be interested. You held it up and I didn't want to push my face right up to the screen to see it. Spare all of you that. Um, I Can think, I talk about my book for a second? Because I think these people will enjoy it. Absolutely. All right. So I, I think I mentioned, or I, I think Jill mentioned earlier that I'm in the process of publishing a wine book myself. And wh what I've done, I probably have 250 wine books at home that are two or three or 400 pages or more. And people don't want to learn that way anymore. So I have developed a book, uh, uh, what I think is revolutionizing how people will learn about wine. So it's a wine trivia book. Again, it's not quite there yet, but it's springtime. Uh, there'll be a one line question. And then underneath it, I'm not having people go to the back of the book, it's gonna be right underneath it, will be the answer. And then an educational, uh, sentence on why that answer is relevant. So everything is on one line. The question is one line. The answer is on one line. I do the world. It's about 3,000 questions and answers. And it just, a, you can, you learn differently by almost flashcards in a way. But, it, you know, I go very in depth in Burgundy Champagne. I go very elementary at the beginning of each chapter. Um, and there's probably 30 chapters. So when that comes, it'll be, I think a lot of these questions, people are on the learning curve and, um, you know, I spend a lot of time in America, France, Italy, Spain, Germany. So it'll be a good book. It's, no one is doing it right now. So I, I want to get I, it out. I see a great, uh, a great future Williston event, uh, either live or virtually of Wine yes. Trivia Night. So yeah. stay tuned folks. Um, 
I'm gonna we're, I'm gonna close the evening with one last question from a very sharp-eyed observer here. Um, John, go ahead and ask your question of Gordon. Where is that barrel room over your left shoulder? Oh, <laughs> that is the Grand Chez at Mouton. Okay. So that's the top, you know, in, in Bordeaux, they have the first year wine stays on the, the ground level, and then they bring the barrels underneath for the second year of aging. So that is the first year Chez, the ab above ground Chez. And I had lunch with Baron Philippe before he passed away. And we had a 1916 out of a six liter. And that's probably my most majestic wine period of my life. So he signed that the menu to me and he gave me the 73. That was the year that was elevated from second growth to first growth was 1973, the Picasso label. Each year, Mouton does a different artist rendering. Right. So 73, Picasso did it. And that's the year that he was elevated. So that's a very special, I mean, I got 50 of these things around the house, but that one's um, very special. Thing. So thanks for asking. Yeah, it's incredible. Thank you. Have you been to Bordeaux? I haven't. No, that's that's the one that we, you guys were talking about Rada earlier. And I was out there two years ago, two or three okay. years ago. Um, and that, that, you know, we've, I've been fortunate enough to travel with the job that I have, and it's it's Wonderful. unbelievable stuff you get to see with this. So, and you're treated royally. I probably went on thirty or forty wine trips, and you just always treated royally. And you have great food and great wine, and you tour the cellars, you tour the vineyards, and it's the best learning experience. Now, going from the restaurant end to the distribution end. You will absorb this like a sponge, John. So keep, right. keep it up. Keep it going. Yeah, it's a lot more than wine at the end of the day. And that's yes, it is. Absolutely right. right. It's history. It's geography. It's tradition. It's uh, friendships. It's uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful. I, I will almost guarantee you're not going to change careers. Right. Yeah, I hope not. <laughs> good, good. All right. Well, I, I, I want to wrap up here. We've gone a little over. Thank you, everyone, for staying with us. Thank you, Gordon, for a fantastic evening.